Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian here in Orlando, Florida at the Air Force Association's annual Air Warfare Symposium, the number one winner gathering of the services leadership, industry executives, thought leaders, analysts, reporters, and more down here uh, in Florida. Our coverage here is sponsored by Leonardo DRS and L3 Technologies, and we're honored to have with us uh, United States Air Force uh, Major General Bill Cooley, who is the commander of the Air Force uh, Research uh, Lab. Uh, sir, you've got one of the best jobs in the whole U.S. Air Force. Thanks very much, and congratulations on the second star. I do. Thank you. Thank you. This is uh, this is my dream job. Uh, I do believe it's the best job in the Air Force. I'm a, I'm a technologist. I'm you know a little unique in in our Air Force uh, in that sense. I've had a, a number of laboratory assignments and acquisition type experience, but uh, I couldn't be happier to. to be leading the men and women of the Air Force Research Laboratory. It's a great, great job. Um, it's also a very interesting times to, to be uh, leading this organization, uh, given the attention and importance of science and technology enterprise going forward. Uh, absolutely, right. I mean, innovation, uh, a lot of it is about how to do things differently and cultural, but it's also about the raw technological uh, piece of that. And you guys have extraordinary horsepower uh, across the enterprise. Secretary Wilson uh, discussed the Science and Technology 2030 plan. She uh, launched that a couple of years ago. You guys have been playing a leading role uh, in shaping that. What are going to be uh, some of the core elements of this from, from your perspective to try to achieve those five areas uh, that she talks about because her whole focus is be disruptive, be where the enemy isn't, uh, you know, take advantage of our strengths and, and, uh, and sort of push on the weaknesses of potential adversaries, stuff that they're trying to do to us in this great power competition. No, thanks for the question. And let me just, let me just step back for a second and, and say that she, uh, initiated this study at an AFA in September of 17 and that AFRL, the Air Force Research Laboratory, was to lead this effort, which we did. Um, as part of that activity, over 12 months, we listened broadly. We had university events, we had industry engagements, we uh, uh, looked at how other businesses do this, how they run their research enterprise. Uh, we took input from you know, anyone who would submit, and there were over a thousand uh, ideas that were submitted, both on technology as well as how to do business differently. Um, and so all of that studying and, and looking is what culminated in uh, the research lab, uh, uh, sometimes I like to say turning in my homework to, to the secretaries in September of this past year. Since that time, it's as not surprising to, to anyone, it's been you know, looked at and reviewed and uh, modified. Uh, I think that the, the core content is, uh, is intact, and part of that core contact, content, the secretary talked about uh, this morning. Um, let me just importantly say that this, the strategy is not yet delivered. She said it's, it, it is coming soon. I'm anxious to get that uh, out on the street. But uh, um, she announced today some of the, the key elements, if you will, of that strategy. Let me just highlight a couple. Uh, the first is it does not include a technology list. Uh, w one of the things that we started off doing in this strategy was to look at all the technology, science and technology strategies that have been put together really since the 40s, since the initial uh, strategy that was put together by uh, Hap Arnold and von Karman in the 1945. Um, the Scientific Advisory Board. The, sci the early Scientific Advisory Board, um, and, and that was a brilliant document. It was a very interesting time and opportunity to sort of capture the technologies that had been coming out of the in development part of World War II. Um, since that time, we basically every decade, there's been some sort of science and technology strategy. Uh, but if you look at it though, some of them have been very impactful and some less so. And so we analyzed uh, what are some of the elements that would make an impactful, meaningful uh, S&T strategy that's, that's going to make a difference. Uh, took that into account. Um, we also noticed that the, uh, many of the strategies included a list of technologies. Um, and that's you know, not particularly surprising, but when you go back and you look starting from about the 80s, the mid 80s I believe, and the strategy since that time, the technologies, that you can find a common thread among the technologies. Directed energy, hypersonics, uh, autonomy. Some of those technologies have been on that short list, if you will, 
uh, doesn't mean that they're wrong. It just means that we asked ourselves, what, uh, what benefit do we believe we're going to achieve by coming out with another technology list? So we took a different approach. We decided that it would be better off to look at what are the key capabilities that the, the broad industry and the technologies need to deliver and then use the energy and dynamism of our system that is, in my view, what gives us the greatest advantage in our economy and in our uh, uh, industry and innovation, and that is competition. We want to compete the technologies that may be able to achieve those capabilities. So we thought long and hard, uh, working with the, the air staff, the Air Force Warfighter Integration Capability uh, Team as part of the, the A5, to, to identify what are those key capabilities that we need to ensure our science and technology enterprise is focused to achieve. And, and so rather than publishing a technology list, we're taking an approach focusing on what are those capabilities and then let's see what technologies can actually achieve those. Um, so we have heard quite a lot uh, about so let's go a little bit across the piece of it, right? You mentioned hypersonics. Uh, there's great opportunity there. Um, U.S. was leading in that field. It looks like we took a little bit of a pause. We're obviously playing, uh, have been investing heavily in that capability, but so are our adversaries. So as you look at each one of these pieces, give us kind of sort of a quick rundown, right? We're on hypersonics. We're on artificial intelligence. Man-machine teaming is seen as something critical. You know, the, the wingman concept, for example, to try to be a force multiplier where a manned aircraft can, can command uh, multiple unmanned systems in its uh, space or even across uh, time and space. Um, there, you know, blockchain, 5G, each one of these potentially changes warfare in very dynamic ways. So as you look across these pieces, give us sort of a runaround on where each one of these pieces is going to fit into this future kind of capabilities mix, uh, given that there are also some real misunderstandings about what AI exactly is or isn't or blockchain is and isn't and what it can provide. So let me let me uh, take a stab at this. I don't know if I'm going to, uh, you, you asked a very broad uh, question um, and, and I'll give you the insights that I can about some of those technologies, but maybe more importantly, how are we going to assess uh, the role that these technologies, the potential benefit that each of these technologies might have. So one of the things that um, uh, I've been spending a fair amount of time and effort, energy, and where you know, we have resources going towards is, is modeling simulation and analysis to be able to smartly assess if we are successful with various hypersonics weapons, what difference does it make? How does that impact the, the uh, warfighters calculus in terms of how they might prosecute a potential conflict. Um, the uh, answering those questions isn't simply done with modeling simulation and analysis. We, we certainly know that. It, it, we've got to include wargaming because we have thinking potentially, you know, thinking adversaries. Um, the additionally, we've got to go do prototyping to prove out whether or not these technologies are even possible if we've modeled them correctly. So there's a series of, of, of activities we've got to do. But uh, when we are in the early stages and looking broadly at all of these technologies, um, it's important to, to do some level of modeling simulation analysis because quite frankly, the human brain can't, uh, is, is not well adept to do to solve the problem that you just asked, which is, okay, given all of these things, electronic, uh, electromagnetic warfare and hypersonics and artificial intelligence, when you roll all these things together and, and say, how do you sort through this? The human brain has a challenge doing that. We, we all come in somewhat inherently biased based on our background. And we've got we've to use advanced computing and some analysis to help us think through that. Now, it doesn't stop there, but, but that's one of the key pieces we're doing. So with that as a backdrop, let me start to address some of the questions. Uh, with respect to hypersonics, there, there is, a, as you know, there's a lot of activities going on in hypersonics. Um, there are, you know, 
we are partnered with DARPA, so DARPA is the program manager, but the Air Force is a is a pretty much a 50-50 investment, so all of those programs that DARPA is doing um, are really Air Force DARPA programs, which is a great partnership. That's how the ecosystem is healthy and works. Uh, in addition to that, we're working with the PEO uh, down at Eglin in this case to look at what are the early potential systems that we might deploy in, in a prototyping type environment. And so they are directly engaged in that. Uh, we are supporting all of the above, uh, but one of the other things that the lab is doing is we're looking at what's the next generation of capabilities. So, so those are capabilities we hope to deliver in the near term. Uh, the question is, is what about you know, uh, larger platforms, uh, scramjets, so there's a variety of activities and, and sustained flight at hypersonic speeds. Those are all extremely challenging technological problems that we're in the process of addressing, which is what you would expect of your laboratory within the hypersonics portfolio. Let me talk about um, the directed energy as another one. Uh, uh, directed energy, there's, there are, uh, significant amount of time and attention on direct energy, both um, high power microwave and, and uh, lasers. We're working across the joint community with our Navy and Army counterparts to uh, identify what are the types of systems that we could actually deploy and ruggedizing them to, to make that happen. So uh, we're not where we want to be, but, but we're continuing to work that. Uh, and I'm a laser guy f from, from the past, so I, I very much am uh, uh, anxious to see us get uh, some laser capabilities on the battlefield, but it's really hard, and and so and we're it's been, it's been like a mirage, right? I mean, every every year is you know the laser. This is going to be the year of the laser, and I've been doing this for almost 30 years, and it's like you know, it's just around the corner. Well, is it around the corner? I like one of uh, uh, Yogi Berra's uh, sayings is, predictions are hard, especially about the future. And so I'm not going to get into the prediction or whatever. What I am going to tell you is we have the right team and technologies uh, and, and efforts in place to, to advance that. And so we're very hopeful, but, um, uh, but we'll see where that goes. I also would mention that artificial intelligence is one of the other big areas, and uh, we have an effort uh, that I'm very excited about uh, to, to deploy a platform uh, that the Air Force, we've been working on within the Air Force Research Laboratory uh, that will, I hope, enable warfighters or our airmen to bring airmen innovation, couple that with artificial intelligence uh, for what we are calling the do-it-yourself artificial intelligence. And so um, we're, we've made great progress over the past year with the, uh, under the direction and, and leadership of Dr. Steve Rogers, um, uh, which is, his call sign is Captain America, which shouldn't surprise anybody. Uh, but uh, Cap and his team have made some great progress uh, advancing that. And, and we're, we have a number of pilot programs that we're in the process of advancing, um, but more to come on that. Things I would like very quickly for you to just like quickly rattle off, like here are the things that have been successes, and the last question is, what's the key, as somebody who's spent a life in innovation, we have all of this talk about innovation, what are the cores and keys? Because honestly, there are a lot of people who are just like, yes, you know, I got to get the goatee, catch it, drinking guy to tell me what it is, and this room probably has more people who are innovative, and I may say that if you don't mind me using the word That's catch fine. it. You, you, it's your show. Okay. Um, you know, you guys have had some real successes that you guys have, have racked up uh, in a row. So talk to us a little bit about what some of those recent highs have been. Okay, let me, um, let me go step back a little bit. Something that I had some uh, personal engagement with. Uh, last spring, we launched the Eagle spacecraft, uh, which is a, a basically an adapter ring that sits between the payload and the launch vehicle. It's called an ESPA ring. And we've turned that into a spacecraft that's separated out. It's now a geostationary orbit. And I would argue fundamentally changing the way we're viewing space and space access and giving us space access for various experimentation. So it has a number of different space payloads on that. Uh, very exciting program uh, that's been on orbit for, well, coming up on a year now. Um, and, and doing very, very well. So I'm particularly excited about that. Uh, we just had a, a successful demonstration of uh, the live virtual construct capability that we have, Slate, which I'm 
struggling to remember the acronym, uh, uh, but, but it's, it's secure. I know the S is secure, and the key piece here is um, to enable our war fighters, the, the, the fighter uh, community, to actually train with the full capabilities of their weapon systems and not necessarily be constrained in the same range box. So, to, so that uh, someone flying in a live jet gets to benefit and see all of the other things that are done virtually from a simulator back in the shop or in a constructive environment that the computer has just generated that. So that can stress systems uh, far more than we can in you know, simple live training at a, and importantly at a much lower cost. So we've uh, shared this, uh, we have advocacy within the Air Combat Command and are very excited about that as a, as a program and we're working with them to figure out what's the next step. And uh, last question, innovation. You've spent more time on innovation than uh, um, almost anybody else in this room, if not anybody else in this room or even at this conference. And there's this perception that the Air Force, that innovation is about getting guys in goatees and black turtlenecks to come in and tell you about this, as opposed to you doing it organically. You've studied this. What are the keys to innovation from your standpoint? Because the Air Force has always prided itself on being, on the entire U.S. military, of constantly problem solving. What's, what's, what are the keys from your standpoint? Uh, that's a great question, and I am thrilled to answer that. Let me just say that um, I'm going to parse this apart a little bit. There's innovation and there's invention. So innovation is figuring out maybe a new application for an existing technology. Um, and we see that all the time and there are people around the, the Air Force, around the DOD who do that. Invention is, is really where the science comes in, the science and the physics and the phenomenology to figure out what are the ways in which we can uh, actually develop new technologies. Um, now, the Air Force Research Laboratory or the science and technology community does not have a monopoly on that, but that's what we specialize in, is to try and bring to bear new physical phenomenology uh, as tech new technologies that can then be applied to a variety of problems. And so technology doesn't know its application until we tell it. And so that's where innovation can come in. Um, I guess the, what I would add with respect to innovation writ large, um, is, is a lot of times what we see is we, we need to have the uh, cross-fertilization of ideas. And that could be from different, uh, uh, different disciplines, you know, uh, chemist, physics, uh, in, um, IT type systems, cyber folks, trying to solve a problem. And they will all come at it with a different uh, perspective. And so uh, ensuring that we have diversity to face and address problems uh, is central to what we need to do in innovation, which is one of the reasons why I am convinced that one of the most important things we can do as an Air Force uh, and more broadly across the military is to bring the warfighter and the technologist into the same ecosystem such that they can innovate because they both bring great insight. I have seen too many times where uh, a warfighter may want, want to do something that physics will not allow, and where uh, our scientists want to do something that is missing the point. And, and so we've got to make sure that we bring them into a problem solving and get more of a uh, um, interaction and dynamic, and I think that will increase our innovation capabilities. Major General Bill Cooley, the commander of the United States Air Force Research Lab. Sir, thanks very much. Real pleasure. Uh, and look forward to having this conversation uh, in the future. Really enjoyed our talk. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it.